After the Bretton Woods system was established, you basically had, you know, between the, the World War I and World War II, you had these floundering currencies everywhere. Yeah. Because everybody was printing way more currency than they had the gold to back up. And you, and you increasingly disassociated the money creation process from gold. And the 1944 agreement, uh, you know, gave back some degree of international stability to these markets. Um, and so that worked for a period of time. The problem was that, again, the, the, the gold was so separate from the bank money creation process that you still had a proliferation of dollar creation. Anytime a, anytime a bank makes a loan, they're basically creating new dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you had the number of dollars in existence grow more than the amount of gold in America's vaults. And so anyone who's smart, uh, foreign central bankers, would say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and take some of our dollars and, and get some of that gold if you don't mind. And so over time, if you look at a chart, gold, American gold holdings kept decreasing throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, and it became more and more apparent that this was going to be a, you know, this was unsustainable. Mm. That the gold was going down while the amount of dollars in existence was going up. Uh, and, you know, the United States would try to slow down that creation. Like if you, if you were aggressively turning your dollars into gold, you became on unfriendly terms with the United States. So you're basically calling their bluff on the system. And so the classic example is the French when they yeah. sent over a battleship and they said, no, we want the gold. We want the actual physical gold, put it on our ship, we'll bring it over. Uh, and as those bluffs were increasingly called uh, on the United States, they eventually had to say, you know what, we have to temporarily uh, stop this gold redemption process. They never said, like Nixon never said, we're going to stop doing this forever. He said, due to uh, speculators and things like that, we have to temporarily stop doing this. And for, but of course, temporary became permanent. And so the dollar was no longer redeemable, even to foreign creditors for gold. So you had this kind of multi-step process where the world wasn't on a gold standard and then off a gold standard. It was, it was step by step. So first it was on a gold standard, and then it was only on a gold standard for certain types of large in, in, like institutional and foreign creditors. And then it was nobody at all can redeem dollars for gold. Right. What, what was breaking in the system? Because a lot of people are um, ardent supporters of the gold standard, thinks, um, you know, our, uh, one of our team, uh, Ben, put the website together. What the fuck happened in 1971 talks about everything that's happened since coming off the gold standard in 1971. But what was breaking in the system at this point? Like, what's, What was stopping the central bank from performing? I think what was breaking was that the money creation process and the amount of gold there are so many abstractions between those two things that the amount of gold could not prevent money creation. Right. And so basically the way I phrase it is not that the bad decisions were not made in 1971. That was like, an, that was just marking to market the problem that had already happened. Okay. By the time you got into the sixties, the system was already broken. There's a combination of fiscal expenditure and just normal bank lending. All of that was resulting in way more currency uh, than the gold that could actually back that up. And that's when you basically go from a free banking system to a central banking system, you just completely, the whole, like the gold in the treasury vaults, you know, the, when banks make loans, they never go check how much gold is sitting in the treasury vaults. They, they're looking at their own capital ratios and consumers are taking out loans and you just have a complete separation. And even foreign, foreign banks could actually collect dollars in the whole offshore market, the whole euro dollar market, and they could make loans. So there's even non-American banks making dollar loans and therefore making more, more claims on dollars in existence compared to the amount of gold sitting in the treasury vaults. And this is why Bitcoin is a better technology for such a standard because you can verify how much exists if, as long as people want to You can verify you how much exists. In whether any, it's real. Yeah, you could do, uh, an institution can do proof of reserves, unlike you know a free bank uh, of a prior era. And then in addition, because it's not, it doesn't have those portability challenges that gold has. It's easier to self-custody or do collaborative custody with and then send it at the speed of light around the world, either through lightning or a little bit slower through base layer transactions. Okay. But the consistent problem here is money creation. The, the ease of creating money, uh, as Jeff Booth would say, dis, uh, creates distortion of money. Yes. It, well, especially if you have something that, if money's defined as a claim for something else, yeah. like banknotes or a claim for gold, uh, if you have the the processes too very like very far apart, then gold ends up not being a constraint for that money creation. 
And that's why throughout history, you'd have these routine peg, deep like peg breaks. We say, okay, now we're going to devalue the currency compared to the gold because you realize we created too much. The question keeps being, why do you keep creating too much? And it's because there's so many steps between the two. Uh, and that that's really kind of the, the outcome, I think, between when you go from that central banking era all the way up to the 1970s, you increasingly abstracted the money creation process from gold. And so even in a free banking era, there would be more dollars, there'd be more claims for gold than gold, but it was a relatively low ratio because any individual entity knew how much gold they had and was issuing notes against that gold. Whereas when you have layers and layers and layers, that's when you get these, the number of claims can be far, far higher than the amount of gold. Okay, so free banking is more um, decentralized risk, whereas central banking, uh, the uh, era central banking would uh, essentially socialize risks. Yes. But it could be um, <sighs> exploited by uh, politicians for political reasons to you know, create money. Um, Whereas at a, in the free banking era, it'd be more about risk and reputation of the banks themselves. So there's just these trade-offs. Yes. But I do, one of the things I've always wondered is, uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism towards central banks and money creation, but I wonder if there has been some benefits from it. Has there, you know, has the, avail the ability to, you know, create money and um, make credit cheap, has that seen an acceleration in innovation? Um, I've always wondered if there's like if there's some benefits we've not openly discussed, and I know that kind of benefit also has a trade-off because for that for whatever winners that exist there, there are losers elsewhere. But are there benefits to the money creation that we don't ever talk about? I the way I would kind of answer that I think is looking at money as a technology, and therefore looking at these steps as some degree of inevitabilities. So when you had gold. And then you had the creation of telecommunications channels and good accounting and ledgers and things like that. The world could move faster than the gold as a bare asset could move. Mm -hmm. And so it became kind of inevitable due to technology. You'd have an abstraction between the two. And that abstraction is easy to arbitrage and centralize. Okay. And the fact that it kind of happened multiple instances throughout the world shows that it's almost an inevitability. It would take profound discipline in order to not have that centralized. Uh, you'd have to have a very strong culture around, you know, keeping that from coalescing. And so it's it's like an unfortunate fact of history that this, the way the technology worked out, the order in which we got technologies kind of led to the abstraction between money and currency and then kind of the state and central banks controlling that currency. And so while it came with advantages, mainly I think a lot of the advantages came from telecommunications channels and and social contracts and things like that, um, it also came with a ton of costs that basically money could be diluted without people even knowing that their money's being diluted because they're holding something that they think is worth a certain amount of gold and then there's a war and then they can just print a lot of money and then be like, oh, now, you're, now your note is worth either less gold or no gold or in theory it could be redeemable but not by you. And you know, so it's kind of a more rapid button that, that, that governments can press compared to what they used to be able to do. So for example, if we were citizens in Rome and Rome was trying to fight wars and they didn't have enough money, clip, clip. they could start being sneaky. They could clip coins, they could make yep. diluted coins. But if I'm holding my gold, uh, you know, it's hard for them to devalue my gold. Over generations, they could do it. But if I'm holding just a claim on gold, then Rome or whatever other country could just, you know, with the snap of a finger, devalue my holding. Because I'm only holding a claim. I'm not actually holding the bare asset. Right, And so that's the environment that we found ourselves in over this past century, century and a half, is people just holding claims and claims can be devalued overnight. Yeah, I mean, this is why it's quite interesting that um, still to this day, uh, many governments and central banks still hold gold um, um, and a lot of individuals don't. It's a bit like, do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of these shitcoin companies that hold Bitcoin but try and push their shit coins to be other people, um, the gold was still the valuable asset that retained its value. Um, do you, like, kind of on a personal level, I'd, I'd love to know your opinion. Do you think there is a role for central banks? Do you think they are a net positive or a net negative? Do you see a world without them and think it might be better? It'd be Just because I trust you so much, I'd, I'd enjoy to 
me and your opinion on that? I think it's largely dictated by technology. Okay. Uh, and so I think it was kind of inevitable that, that there would arise in this period where telecommunications and information could travel faster than money. Basically, the, the fact that that arbitrage existed almost inevitably would lead to central banks existing and the, the, any sort of advantages and disadvantages that came from that. Um, I think if we get to a point, either through Bitcoin and, and, and just, you know, it's the long run, here we go, I think that you can reduce or eliminate the need for central banks. They no longer make sense, potentially, in that type of environment. So, for example, if someone would ask me if I'm in favor of price controls, my answer would be no. I think that markets should set prices. Um, and that includes things like energy and the price of money, the, 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 the lending rate that different institutions decide to lend to each other. So, no, I, don't, I think in the long run, we should not have central committees, literally a group of like, a bunch of great old men. Yeah, a bunch of gray-haired people deciding what the what the price of money is going to be uh, in a 330 million person country that then also has ramifications for the whole world. I, I think that's a very analog and silly model in this day and age. But I think that it was in some ways. I think a lot of it people focus on the idea that it was immoral, and in many ways it was. I mean, the whole point is everybody wants to get their their bigger share. So they want to, you know, if you're in a position of power, you, you like the Cantillon effect, right? Of course. But in some ways, I view it as a technological inevitability. When you, when you had information and commerce travel faster than money, that's, just, that's what's going to arise. And if you can make that money travel as fast as commerce can, then I think it narrows any sort of reason why, in the long run, you would have central banks. And, and where we are right now with central banks and where we are right now with the economy... Uh, is this just a, like uh, a natural uh, place we've got to because of the kind of inherent flaws within central banking and the misincentives and you know, the ability to create money? Or has something gone extra specially wrong over the last, say, 20, 30 years? I think that a couple of things converge. So one is the long-term debt cycle. Uh -huh. And I think that a lot of that is fueled by central banking. A lot of that is fueled by central banking. Uh, and then two, you just have cultural shifts. You build up institutions, and after a number of generations, uh, the institutions seem like they don't make sense anymore. It's a new technology, a new culture, uh, and you start to get less and less trust and more and more corruption in those institutions, both public and private. Uh, and then coinciding with that is, we talked about in our, in our, in our prior episode, the commodity cycle, where, you know, and, and also the globalization cycle, where we've kind of arbitraged geographic labor and arbitraged energy and commodities. And so I think what we're seeing right now is this combination of the long-term debt cycle. So I think we're kind of getting the payback period for a multi-decade kind of price controls of uh -huh. money, essentially. And then we're also experiencing that specifically because we're at the phase of the commodity cycle and the supply chain cycle where it's hard not to have inflation. And because central banks and other factors have led to so much debt accumulation in the economy, they can't really raise rates. And they, they can't really kind of backstop and make sure that a currency kind of continues to be worth a certain amount of energy. And so I think that's where we're in now, where we have to go back to the 40s to find a similar type of extreme environment, at least in terms of fiscal and monetary policy.